Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Gulf Coast State College. I'm Professor Carrie Fioramonti. I teach biology in the natural science division here. Uh, this is, I think, maybe our 10th year of citizen science and our partnership with Baywatch, formerly St. Andrew Bay RMA. Um, again, we welcome everyone in our community out to these events. So much for attending and also for sharing. This evening, we have Audubon, Bay County Audubon Society here to present Backyard Birds. We have Donna Cromwell, Ron Hauser with Audubon. And I wasn't sure if I should, uh, if anyone here is on the board of Baywatch, I would love it if you would perhaps stand and just say hello. We have some new officers on the board of Baywatch. That's right. So, and they have a wonderful uh, uh, kiosk out in the front, a little display, talking a little bit about some of their efforts here in ba the Bay County area. You can also, uh, on the sign-in sheet, request information if you would like to get more information about Baywatch and maybe even Bay County Audubon Society. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead without further ado and let Donna and Ron tell us a little bit about some of the I don't know, year-round residents and sometimes visitors here in Bay County. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Donna Cronwell. Um, I have no background in science, biology. Uh, this all started with me about 15 years ago. I bought my first digital camera, then I had to buy a zoom lens, and it's gone from there. So I uh, spent a lot of money in a camera store, but uh, but that's what got me started. And the one way that I learned was to go take a picture, go home, get my bird books out, and figure out what I saw that day. So that's how I've learned. Uh, Ron? Okay, uh, I'm Ron Hauser. I've been with Bay County Audubon for, I just counted it up, about 46 or 47 years. That's when I started birding. So uh, after that long a period of time, you sort of get to know a little bit about the birds, and especially the local birds and the, what the, what, what they sound like, so you recognize their calls and their, uh, their uh, uh, um, well, well, you recognize them by sight and by sound. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for a long time, and um, we in Audubon have, um, our chapter is uh, about 300 members, and uh, I have some information up here, or brochures, if you'd like to join or check us out. Uh, we're on Facebook. Um, and uh, some other things. Uh, we have monthly meetings. We have monthly field trips. We've got one coming up this weekend and next weekend. If you're interested, just uh, come up and we'll talk about that later. But uh, that's enough of that, so I guess we can go ahead and start, Donna. Okay. So what did you see today? I do have to tell you, right before I came here, I heard something outside. I was at a meeting. I came home and I kept hearing something. I'm like, what in the world is that bird? And, uh, and Ron will tell you, he, Ron told me about a new app, uh, Merlin, and you can press a button and it does sound, because I couldn't find the bird. And I got a new bird for my yard today, a kestrel. Uh, there were two flying around and landed on my, uh, uh, I've got a big old, old uh, TV tower out back, and they both landed on it, so I got a new bird. He's not in here, though. <laughs> so I am a bird nerd. And these are some uh, common birds that I have seen at my feeders or uh, in my yard. Uh, sometimes I see one of these guys. Uh, I do live on a pond, and uh, they come up in the yard occasionally. And if you have put out bird seed, you might grow some of these as well. Uh, don't ask me about how to keep squirrels off my feeders. I just buy lots of bird seed and everybody gets some. So when it's gone, it's gone. So I have very fat squirrels. <coughs> Oops, let me go back. Okay, so what are some common birds that come to my feeder? Uh, Northern Cardinal, uh, bright red. This is the male. They're here year round and has the crest on top of their head. Uh, the female doesn't have that bright red, but basically the same size and shape. Uh, the northern mockingbird uh, is our state bird, and they can mimic the sounds of other birds. Uh, a little bit later, I'm going to show you uh, some photos of uh, 
Oh, I'm going to go blank. Uh, some birds we started getting on our yard the last two years. This past year, they learned their sound. So a mockingbird can learn up to over 200 different sounds. Uh, we have the blue jay. They are just bright blue, and they're here year-round. Uh, Carolina chickadee. This is one of the smaller birds that are in my yard, and when our kids were little, uh, the way we taught them to listen for them was by their name. Chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. So if you hear a bird in your yard making that sound, more than likely it's a Carolina chickadee. And for some reason, when the chickadees show up, the tufted tit mice show up. I don't know what's going on, but they show up. Ron might know what's going on. But uh, they're always fun to have in the yard as well. We get house finches. The male's on the left, the female is on the right. Uh, the female really doesn't have a lot of color, except brown and beige. But the female has some, some red in him uh, on the top and on his chest. I might, might just mention that the finches typically have a large bill that are, is adapted to cracking seeds, like sunflower seeds and other tough seeds. Uh, it's just a very strong bill, and the cardinal is in that uh, family. Uh, two years ago was the first time I ever saw a purple finch in my yard, and uh, they're similar but a lot more red. Uh, or purple, I guess, but uh, we've got several different kind of doves. It seems like since the hurricane, morning doves have just uh, grown <laughs> in numbers. And, uh, but this is a morning dove. Uh, I get white winged doves. Uh, I've seen four at a time at my feeders, uh, which is probably kind of rare, but they, they come quite often to the feeder and you can see the, the white at the wing. Uh, we have Eurasian collar doves. Now, this was taken in my backyard prior to the hurricane. I don't get them in my yard anymore. So, but they're here. So something has definitely changed since the hurricane. Uh, if, if you listen, if you watch some of these British shows on uh, TV, uh, in the background, you will hear this bird because it's a European bird. And it came over here about 40 years ago, and it has spread throughout the country. But before that, they weren't here. Somehow they got here. But you can always hear that typical call. We have ground, uh, common ground doves. Now, I live close to Sam's, a little north of it. I've never seen a ground dove in my yard. But I know people in Lynn Haven. I know people on the beach that see them, so it's included. Uh, but just probably the smallest dove that we have and, and uh, just a real pretty in that scallop around the head and, the, and under the, the chin. Yeah. Um, we get, I get uh, brown-headed nuthatches. Although I started thinking after I was going through this presentation, I don't know that I'm getting them like I used to. I had pine trees in my backyard and if you ever go to St. Andrews and see this little bird going up down the pine trees, looking under the bark, it's probably this guy. Um, so I'm gonna have to keep my eye out to see if I'm getting them like I used to. But they would come to the feeder and, and get seed. And uh, if, if you're out and you hear a sound that sounds like a little squeaky toy, like a little rubber duck, squeak, squeak, squeak that's the brown-headed nuthatch because it has a sound just like the squeaky toy. And then I get, I put out millworm and I've brought some different uh, seed and different things. This is a, a dried millworm. Uh, you can get live millworm and put it out, but what will normally come for the millworm are bug eaters. So uh, Carolina wren, it's not a real big bird, but what amazes me is it's how loud it is for the size of the yeah. bird. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, but just a really uh, pretty little bird and fun to watch. And bluebirds. Uh, bluebirds like it to be more open and since the hurricane, most of us have lots of open yards and they have just gone crazy around my neighborhood. So this is the male 
And this is a female, not so blue, but still pretty. Um, my husband has built bluebird boxes and we put them in our yard. We've given them to neighbors. Uh, this is actually on a telephone pole across the street from our house. And they use the box and they'll have uh, two, three, four clutches a year that come out of the box. So, And it's been fun because the neighbors have little kids and it helps to introduce them to uh, the, the birds. And uh, going back to the bluebird, if you, if you would like to attract them, be sure you, you buy a box that is designed just for bluebirds. Um, it has to be exactly the right size hole and the dimensions are, are specific for bluebirds. Uh, otherwise, other birds may get in there. And you may have to have a predator guard on the outside. Otherwise, other birds and squirrels will, will get in there. So yeah, now they'll make the hole bigger, even though you may have started with you know, the right size hole. Once another bird gets in there, they can make it bigger and, and take over the nest. So um, I get pine warblers. Uh, brown thrashers. Uh, typically, I'm going to see them in the backyard next to the pond and the bushes and stuff, but they do come to my feeders in the front yard. So I think I've, last year sometime there were four all together at one time, but I think they also like to, uh, this is in a, a planter bed and all the stuff falls down and then under that stuff are bugs. So they're, they're looking in the feeder for bugs and then they're getting on the ground for bugs. Uh, a couple years ago, I had a hermit thrush that kind of hung out all winter, and that was kind of cool because he'd show up every day looking for uh, mealworms and other bugs, and he'd get down under the feeders as well. Uh, ruby crown kinglet. This is, besides a hummingbird, probably the next smallest bird that I see. And I walked outside today and, and heard him. Uh, they're not real big, and if you don't learn the sound, you're probably not going to really see them. And they make a distinct little sound. And once you learn it, you'll, it's like, okay, where is he? You know, because you're looking for this little bitty bird. When he gets upset, uh, the ruby crown kinglet has some red feathers on the top of its head. And they usually, this is not a very good picture, but those feathers come up and you can kind of tell he's upset with somebody, you or somebody. And I get gray, uh, blue gray gnat catchers. And they're usually in the back too. Uh, but they will get up in the oak tree in the front yard and, and they're looking for bugs. And we've got several types of woodpeckers. Um, one of the most common is the red belly woodpecker. When I first started birding, I'm like, well, why isn't this called a red headed woodpecker? Because his head's red. Well, I hadn't seen a red headed yet, so. Once I did, I understood. But uh, you can see on the photo on the right that he does have a little pink on his belly. I don't see it that often. I don't know, you might know if it's male Breed, or uh, female it has. Is no, more. it's just breeding season, they get that. Okay. So they are called a red belly woodpecker, even though their head is partially red. We get downy woodpeckers, and they're probably the smallest woodpeckers uh, that I get in my yard. The male is on the right and the female is on the left. Uh, the males will have a little red on the top of their head to distinguish them. Uh, they have um, laid, uh, made a home in a pecan tree in my backyard. Uh, unfortunately, it came down with a storm, so it's not there anymore. But uh, it was fun to watch them feed the babies. And I guess certain times of year we get the yellow belly sap suckers um, in, the, in my yard. And the redhead is on the right. So you can tell why he's called a redhead. Uh, I don't get them in my yard. I've never, if I got one, I'd, I'd probably freak out. But, um, but I know people in Lynn Haven get them in Southport. And they're also out on the beach. I've seen them at St. Andrews State Park. I've seen them at conservation parks, so they're in our area. It's just I get certain birds, and then I don't get certain birds, so he's one of them. The uh, sapsucker's interesting bird. It's the only migratory uh, woodpecker that we have here. The rest of them are full-time residents. 
And if you have a, a sweet gum tree in your yard, you'll notice a bunch of little holes that go from that in a horizontal fashion all the way around the tree. Well, that's from the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker. They poke the holes in there, and then they uh, come back later. All the sap will be running out of those holes, and they'll lick the sap with their tongue. And also, they'll eat the uh, insects that are attracted by the, uh, the sap. That's why they call them sap suckers. And we do have pileated woodpeckers. This is the largest woodpecker that we have in this area. Again, this was taken at my sister's house and she's on, you know, 20 acres. Uh, but people on Lynn Haven, Southport, people on the beach, uh, you go to Conservation Park and you probably will, if not see one, you'll hear one. So they're definitely out in that direction. Yeah, and we do have a field trip to the Panama City Beach Conservation Park, not this weekend, but the next weekend. And uh, out there, you can see up to six different species of uh, woodpeckers, in, including this one. We saw two of them uh, mm -hmm. last week, last time we were yeah. up there. Uh, because I'm on a pond, uh, there's cattails, and I get red-winged blackbirds, and they do show up at the feeders as well. Uh, the, the male is black with red, orange, or yellowish shoulders. And the female's kind of plain, uh, but still pretty. So, and I haven't seen one yet, but in the winter, these guys show up, the brown-headed cowbirds. They will clean my feeder out in about an hour. <laughs> so, um, but they're still, I think they're still pretty. You know, the brown head and, and the back is uh, almost iridescent black, and uh, they're still a pretty bird. Uh, can you go back to the cowbird? Uh, interesting fact about the cowbird, it, is, it, it does not build its own nest. Uh, it lays its eggs in other birds' nests and expects the other birds to raise the young. <laughs> and they do. Uh, it's a native bird, but it's called a, it's a brood parasite. And sometimes those other, the, the young cowbirds will outcompete and out-eat the other birds, especially warblers, and that's why the, some of the warbler species are declining. That's just one, one reason. But they're still native and they're protected. And I will get common grackles at my feeders as well certain times of year. So um, Now we have seal visitors. Uh, some are in the winter, some are in the summer, spring. Uh, chipping sparrows. Uh, actually saw my first two today. Uh, sometime, when they show up in the winter, I can count 30 to 40 at my feeder at one time. So they will show up and, and they're, I would say, one of the smallest sparrows. They're very small mm -hmm. for a sparrow. So uh, yellow rump warblers. Saw my first ones for the winter at St. Andrews Day Park uh, Saturday. So they have showed up. There were lots of them. And you can find, know what they are because they've got a yellow patch on their rump. Uh, also called a butterbud. So. And goldfinches. Um, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, before the storm, on a, on a very good day, I could count 30 to 35 goldfinches at my feeders at one time. Since the hurricane, uh, two years ago I may have seen four the whole season, and I'm not sure this past winter if I saw any. Uh, they do like, if you've ever seen these pouches, uh, you can hang them up. They have a very little seed in them. Uh, they also come in tubes, or you can buy just a seed and put it in a, your own container. But uh, they really like that seed. Um, so I'll put that out. And they, they would usually show up at my house about January and stay for a couple of months. Uh, this is their winter plumage. If you were to go up to the Smoky Mountains in the summer, they're gonna be bright yellow. Uh, they're yellow, but not, not bright yellow. Uh, so again, the hurricane has changed things either in my yard or in our area and they're, they're going somewhere else, so. 
uh, cedar wax wings. Um, I start seeing them about January, February. They're one of my favorite birds. Um, I have neighbors that have mulberry trees and they allow me to go on their property and photograph them. Uh, this particular tree, my neighbor actually stood up for me, one of the main trunks to save it after the hurricane and, and it has survived. So he was thinking about me. Um, but they, they love the mulberries and when they show up in our area, they will show up maybe hundreds at a time. And they can land on a bush that was full of berries and by the end of the day, they're gone. Um, and they love the mulberries. Um, one thing I thought was interesting is uh, my family, we go up to Canada periodically in the summer and I've seen them up there and you just see maybe a pair or a couple here and there. You don't see them in these large flocks. And so somehow they, you know, right before they head north, they're all kind of congregating together. And I can remember somebody telling me before I ever knew what they sounded like, well, it sounds like a faint whistle. Well, once you learn that sound, you go, oh, now I know what they meant, because that's what it sounds like, a faint whistle. And you may not see them, but you'll hear them. And then once you hear them, you know, you can find them in the tree they're hiding, because they're, they're not a real big bird, but they're definitely very colorful. Mm -hmm. So. And another thing, they are uh, berry eaters, and when they do eat, they eat a lot. Uh, a number of years ago in near Thomasville, Georgia, uh, there was a whole flock, and they were found dead on the streets in, uh, in the town. And um, they did uh, uh, necropsies on the birds, and they found that their crops were full of Nandina berries. So uh, Nandinas have small amounts of cyanide in them, and so they were poisoned by the Nandina berries. So if you have Nandinas in your yard, uh, please get rid of them. They are, uh, they're not native, and they are invasive and harmful to the birds. Uh, if you don't want to get rid of them, at least cut off the berries. I know after uh, seeing them in my neighbor's yards and their mulberry trees, we went to Lowe's and like, oh, let's plant us a mulberry tree. Well, Lowe's does not sell fruit-bearing mulberry trees. You have to go to a native plant nursery to get one because it's gonna make, people don't want it, the berries, because they make a lot of mess. But in somebody's backyard, they're not gonna be under a car or anything, they're wonderful. And the birds just, they love the, the mulberries. You don't have to have just mulberry, however. We've got a right. green ash tree in the front yard, and those folks arrive and whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple years ago, we had a Baltimore Oriole show up and stayed for a little while at the feeders. Oops. Uh, we got a, some juveniles. And they do come to your hummingbird feeders, as you saw. Yes, and uh, we also would, uh, I'd buy oranges and cut them in half, and the pole, let's see, not that one, but the hook that it's on, I started poking a hole in the orange and sticking it on top of the hook, and they would eat the, uh, the orange, out of the orange. So that's also good for them. There for a while, about one week a year, these guys would show up. And I, when they showed up, I got rid of some plants in front of them because they were hiding behind the plants. I took the screen out of my window and I set me up a little blind so I could put my camera lens through it because I couldn't get close to them. But uh, the guy on the uh, left is an indigo bunting and the ones on the right are blue grosbeaks. Uh, just a really beautiful little bird. Uh, and that's the indigo bunting. It's, they're very small. They're, the gross beaks are bigger, but the, the buntings are not real big. And every now and then I get the res, rose-breasted gross beaks coming to the feeders. And this is my favorite bird, uh, painted bunting, probably the most colorful bird that we have. I've never had a male at my feeder, I will tell you that. <laughs> I have traveled great distances to see a male painted bunting. But 
People on the beach get them. People in Lynn Haven get them, but not at my house. <laughs> but the girl on the right was taken in my front yard, so uh, that is the female. And so I just. When do you see those? Probably. April. March ish? Uh, maybe the end of March, but mostly like middle of April. And, and they would just show up for a week and then they're gone. I, I don't see them again, but. Just gorgeous little bird. I do get summer tanagers periodically. This is the male, and they've got a, a very big beak. Uh, and this is a female. And I got a scarlet tanager last year. Uh, the photo on the, the left was taken at St. George Island, and they just were everywhere uh, one time when we went with Audubon. And the one on the right, I heard something hit my front window. <laughs> and I looked outside and this little guy was, I've got some lilies out there and he was sitting up in it and it was, it was kind of holding him upright and he did fly away. So I've at least had one in my yard, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, American Robins, um, they're here in the winter they seem February, maybe March, would show up in my yard and there would be probably hundreds. Uh, I haven't seen them as much after the hurricane. Something again has changed, but they would show up. I know if I drive up to the airport, they're just all over the place. So, but uh, they, they are here in the winter time. And the hummingbirds. I don't, I don't get a lot of hummingbirds, uh, but I mainly get ruby-throated hummingbirds. The male, you can tell he's, why they're called that, uh, is on the right and a female or a juvenile is on the left. I usually just get the females or juveniles, but uh, not the pretty ones. Um, and then uh, one of our members had this Rufus hummingbird a year or two ago and let me go hang out in his front yard to get a picture. We do have a member in Callaway, and she just posted a week or two ago on Facebook, is it six or eight different types of hummingbirds in her yard? And she's got, if you go to her house, it's all set up with all different kinds of native plants, and she knows how to attract them. So they're here. Uh, I just don't have enough plants, I think, in my yard for them. And if you do put uh, hummingbird feeders out, um, I don't buy the pre-made stuff. Uh, I just do uh, four cups or four of whatever, four cups of water to one cup of sugar. So just think of your hand and it's just a one to four ratio. So, uh, and just try, if it's real hot outside, you wanna change it, I don't know, every few days or a, at least a week to keep it all nice and clean. The one good thing about the hurricane is we lost our big oak tree in the backyard and we lost all our pine trees. And so three years ago, we put up this purple Martin house, which we had prior to moving here 20 something years ago, but we had too many trees in the backyard and they like it open. So we, uh, we put it back up and the first year we didn't get any takers, but the second and third year in this past year, we did. And so Purple Martins, if you ever get a chance, they are very cool. Uh, the adult male is on the right and the female or juvenile is on the left. <clears throat> Before we got them, I, I had, uh, when my kids were little and drop them off at school and I went to their ballpark and some lady in her backyard had a bunch of Purple Martins. And so I was taking pictures and I noticed the sound they make, how they communicate. They make a clicking sound. Um, my husband was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, as soon as we got them, he figured it out. But they, they make a clicking sound to communicate with each other, and it is, it's really neat to listen to. Um, they show up about March, and then they leave the end of June, 1st of July. Uh, they show up, they lay eggs, the eggs hatch, they feed them, and when they... Um, leave the nest, they're ready to 
do whatever they do. I think they congregate somewhere in Florida or somewhere before they head to Brazil. So they're going all the way to Brazil for the summer, or their winter. <clears throat> but this is one of the gourds um, with the babies. And when they, the, the parents are very busy once those babies uh, get a little older, keeping them fed. And this was taken probably just a, a day or two before they left. Uh, you can see the adult male there, and then the rest are uh, a lot of juvenile. But. And this is just a different type of purple Barton house. I, this is somebody in uh, <coughs> uh, Mexico Beach had. Uh, but there are several different types. And the gourds we have, they're plastic. Uh, some people like the regular native gourds and use those. We've tried to grow them, haven't had a lot of success yet, but uh, we're working on it. I get Eastern Phoebes uh, in the yard. In the summer, I get great crested flycatchers, and this guy was taking over a bluebird box. <coughs> and uh, the catbirds, I think, are showing back up. If you ever go to a park or and you think you hear this meow sound, it's like, where is that cat? <laughs> it's probably not a cat, but it's this guy. Uh, they sound like a cat, so uh, make a lot of meow noises. In the summer, I get northern perulas, and it, this is also a bird that I had to learn the sound that they make, and once you learn it, uh, you, you can find them. Otherwise, they're at the top of the trees, and, and they're not very big, so you're not going to see them, especially in the summer when you got a lot of foliage. Uh, they're hard to find. In the winter, we get orange crown warblers, um, kind of probably the plainest warbler that we have, but any warbler I get at my feeder, I get excited about. Yellow-throated warblers in the backyard. Oops. Hooded warbler. Black and white, and, and they're usually just going through. They're not hanging around, but going through during migration. And about a week after the hurricane, I saw this guy. Never had a yellow-billed cuckoo in my yard, but what was interesting is one year later, about the same day, he, I saw him again. I didn't see him this past October, but I may have been out of town, so I don't know. But that was cool seeing a yellow-billed cuckoo in my yard. And we get lots of hawks. Uh, red shoulder hawks are probably the most common. Um, I get coopers. This one actually popped a bird on my feeder and then ate it in the front yard. So, and when he was done, he, he was out there about 30 minutes. All that was left was the feathers. So, and this guy was uh, this past spring across the street hanging out on my neighbor's Jeep. I am on a pond, so I get mallards, and there's more in the winter, so I know that they're not all just pets. Uh, they are migrating through. Uh, everybody probably sees osprey in the area. Uh, if you look overhead, you might see some white pelicans that fly over. This group probably was about 40 of them flying over at a time. And we have lots of bald eagles. Uh, Saw one this morning, looking out my window, flying by. Um, I drive down 23rd Street, and there'll be one flying by. So if you just pay attention, you're going to see them. But they're here. And if you're not careful, you too could become a bird nerd. <laughs> uh, when you start looking at birds at the beach, when you go to other parts of the state, uh, one good thing about the hurricane, I don't know how many of y'all go to St. Mark's or even know where it is, uh, it's south of Tallahassee on the coast, and this flamingo showed up after the hurricane. I took a photo of him just a couple of weeks ago, so four years later, he's still at St. Mark's. Uh, he moves around, but he's still there, so he's why everybody shows up these days. So, and then when you travel around, 
Other parts of the country have similar birds and you want to get them because they're a little different. Uh, so even though we may have some of these birds here, they're going to be different. And then there's birds that we don't have here. Uh, and this I shot in Canada. We go up there um, in the summer. We get the loons in their summer plumage. And this one was shot in St. Andrews uh, Bay last winter. So they come here in the winter. They're out in the bay, but they do not look as pretty, nor do they, I don't hear the sound they make either. I don't know. Sometimes you can, you can hear Sometimes, it. but not like in Canada. <laughs> it's just... Uh, the sound they make is amazing. So, what do you need to get started in birding? Uh, put bird feeders out, and Ron's going to talk about that, uh, and plants, so I'm not going to say anything. Binoculars help. You know, some of these little birds, I mean, you might go out and see a great blue heron, and he's this big, and he's easy to see, but when you're trying to, you know, see a little bird this big, the binoculars help. Um, Cameras help me the most, you know. Uh, I would say you need at least the 300 millimeter lens. Uh, the longer, the better. You never have enough reach for some of these birds. But, uh, you know, that way you can go home, get three books out like I did, and still not figure out what the bird <coughs> was. So, uh, There's lots of bird books out there on the market and birding apps, uh, eBird. Um, one thing that I've started doing is if I know I'm going somewhere, I go on eBird and see what people are seeing, you know, so I know what to keep my eyes out for. And if it's not a bird I'm used to <clears throat> or know about, then I can go to my books and make sure I know what it looks like and maybe what it sounds like. <clears throat> Ron told me about Merlin, and I'm loving it. Uh, you just click on the sound and walk around, and it will sit there and tell you every bird that it picks up. Uh, so it, it's really good. And it's I'm free. <coughs> yes. If you go to your app store and search for Merlin bird app, download it, and it's free. It's put <laughs> by the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology and National Audubon Society together. And, and uh, they've just got a large database of photographs, uh, bird sounds, and uh, just amazing what they can do now. So we walk around. Instead of using our bird books, uh, we use our phones because <laughs> it's all on here. And like she said, you can just, uh, if you don't hear, if you hear a bird, you don't know what it is, you open up the microphone and it will tell you what that bird is. Some birds sound a lot alike, like some of the wrens, and it will differentiate how it knows, I don't know. Yeah, I. Like I said, before I came here, I kept hearing a bird out front, and I knew there were a couple of them, and I just hadn't, didn't know what it was. So it picked up an American kestrel, a red-winged blackbird, and a northern mockingbird. So it is just cool to do that and to uh, sit there and just hit sound, and it'll pick it up. So it's, I'm using it more and more, that's for sure. Have you ever just nerded out Yes. That's the la yeah. lazy way of doing it, but it works. <laughs> I have done that before. <laughs> you never know what you might miss. <laughs> so, yes. All right. So, Ron, I'll let you take over there to the clicker. Okay. All right. Okay. These were some great photographs. Uh, Donna is just a great ph photographer, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Which one is it, Donna? The, the right one? Side one, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I just want to give you a quick uh, summary or overview of how to attract birds to your yard. I've got a whole hour-long program on this, but I'll just hit some of the high points. Um, so which... Which house do you think would attract more birds? The one on the left, the th traditional uh, type of landscaping, or the one on the right with all the plants? And I think this is in South Florida, so it's probably got a lot of native stuff I don't recognize. Obviously, it's the one on the right. So uh, just as in 
is in nature, biodiversity uh, is good. The more species of plants you have, the more species of critters and birds. So they need the, birds need the same thing we do, food, water, and shelter. Uh, shelter in the form of uh, roosting places, places to hide from predators, and places to nest. Uh, water sources they have to drink to, and obviously food. Uh, and Donna brought some uh, examples of some of the good bird seed. Uh, if you buy the if you buy the cheap stuff, it'll have a lot of these reddish brown seeds in them that the birds don't eat. So they they use that as sort of a filler. So be sure you get the right uh, kind of bird seed. Uh, if you're just going to buy one type of seed, black oil sunflower is probably the best. More birds eat that than any other type of seed. Uh, if, if you don't like the mess that it makes, then you can buy already hulled uh, sunflower seeds, and the birds just love those too. But so do squirrels. Uh, but there are um, lots of, there are squirrel-proof bird feeders, and you can get those at Wild Birds Unlimited, and that's where you should probably be, be buying your, all your bird stuff. Yeah, bread products don't really provide any nourishment for birds. Uh, so fruits are okay, um, but not bread. You see people feeding ducks all the time, but it's really not very nutritious. It fills them up, but it's not nutritious. Okay. So these are a couple of types of feeders. One on the left is a uh, squirrel-proof feeder. It, the, the cage slides down when a squirrel gets on it, but it stays up because the birds are not very heavy. And these are a couple of female uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks on that feeder. Uh, water. Well, uh, <clears throat> if you're going to feed the birds, uh, uh, I mean, if you're going to use water baths, make sure they're not very deep. One inch at the most, one and a half inches. Two is probably a little bit too, too much for some birds because their legs are very short and you don't want to drown them. They just like to get in and bathe. They don't, uh, so you see a lot of water baths that are like three or four or five inches deep. Uh, they, can, they can perch on the side and drink that, but they can't bathe in it. Those little play, uh, cl clay plant trays are perfect. And you have to keep them filled and uh, clean because they will get mold. Okay, shelter and nesting. Um, each, if you're going to provide bird uh, houses for some birds, like the uh, bluebirds, tufted titmice, uh, chickadees, woodpeckers, uh, great crested flycatchers, each of these birds have specific requirements for their, the size of the box they, uh, and the entrance hole. Uh, so be sure you go to a website that has all that information. Uh, avoid those generic boxes that you see at Walmart or somewhere. They're, they may or may not attract birds. Um, uh, the main thing is you need, you need shrubs and trees for nesting and roosting, especially native ones. Chemicals, really bad for the birds. Uh, if you let a lawn service spray your yard, you don't know what they're putting in there, or what they've got in there. That uh, They're out to kill the insects, like mole crickets. Unfortunately, mole crickets are one of the favorite foods of bluebirds. I see them in my yard all the time eating uh, mole crickets. If you're poisoning them, they will eat the dead ones, and, uh, hope, and, and it may pass it on to their young, and they may kill them. Don't put decon in your yard. Uh, although it kills mice, the, the uh, hawks and uh, owls will eat the dead mice and it will kill them too. And as well as rabbits and other wildlife. But why even have grass? Uh, it's just a modern day invention that we've become accustomed to, but you cannot, we, our whole goal is to 
in the Native Plant Society and in Audubon, uh, we try to get people to eliminate 50% of their lawn and replace it with native shrubs, native uh, ground covers, trees, uh, and that will do so much more for the, for the environment. And it'll save you some work in, in uh, maintaining uh, your yard. Ken Rudisill. Yes. Ken Rudisill said, hey, those weeds are green. Mow them. Leave them alone. That's right. That's I stopped putting fertilizers, chemicals, and water on my yard years ago, and it's still green. Uh, it's weeds, if you can call it weeds, but it's, uh, it's fine. I don't mind it. Uh, you can replace some of that grass with uh, sunshine mimosa, which is a native vine that, that makes them these, uh, they call them powder puff mimosas, the little pink flowers. Um, you can make these islands by, you know, delineating it with a hose and then uh, putting down some cardboard and then a whole, a, a big layer of mulch and then planting native sh shrubs. There are ways to uh, do that on YouTube. You can check that out. And try to uh, um, plant 75% native plants. That doesn't mean you've got to dig up all your uh, azaleas, and, but uh, native plants are so much better. And I'll tell you why in just a little while. More diversity of plants equals more diversity of insects and birds. So here's the problem. Uh, the natural lands in the U.S. are uh, severely impacted by human activity. The loss of habitat means loss of biodiversity, obviously. So in an area, say, in a county, if, if a county loses 50% of its natural uh, forest or natural habitat, that means that 50% of the wildlife will also disappear. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So that's why we what, that's why we do programs like this to educate people. We give bird we give uh, programs to uh, 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 gardening groups and other groups. Uh, the Native Plant Society and Audubon people know that about the 75 percent uh, thing. And uh, we're also advocates for creating more green spaces and native plant habitats. So we work uh, the Audubon works closely with Native Plant Society, and we do have a Native Plant Society chapter here. It's called the Sweet Bay Native Plant Society. And we also partner with the Bay County Conservancy, which is a land uh, preservation, uh, uh, it's a nonprofit you know, land trust, basically. It's sort of built on the concept of the Nature Conservancy, but it's just a local group. But we, I'm on the board of that, too, and we have uh, probably 25 or 30 different properties in, uh, in, in the surrounding counties, and Kerry is a board member of that too. So one thing you can do is add a wildflower meadow. Um, if you've got a big area you don't know what to do with, just uh, plant some wildflower seeds out there. And you can go to this website called floridawildflowers.com and they will sell you native wildflower seeds. Don't buy the stuff you, you buy in the store, uh, like Walmart or Lowe's, because a lot of that's non-native, and a lot of it won't grow, and some of it is very uh, aggressive uh, and may take over. Um, Leatris, that's on the left, that's in my, uh, my uh, wildflower meadow. Scarlet salvia, that one's so easy to grow, and the hummingbirds and the butterflies love it. Uh, beautyberry. That's an indestructible plant. It's a native plant that's loved by the uh, uh, mockingbirds and catbirds and other birds. Uh, the ber berries are blooming, are, I mean the berries are ripe this time of year. Um, and you just plant it and forget it. The uh, goldenrod is such an easy plant to grow, but yet you go out there and there's insects all over it all the time. These are pollinators. Okay, so the, the, the single most important thing to learn is the dependent relationship between native plants, native insects, and native birds. Um, 
So uh, one, one reason you, you, you see uh, native plants being uh, chewed on by insects is because those insects have adapted and, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to these plants over, over hundreds or thousands of years. And they're able to assimilate the chemicals, but they cannot assimilate chemicals from non-native trees and shrubs like popcorn trees. That's why you never see anything eating popcorn trees because they haven't been here long enough for our animals and insects to um, assimilate their chemical, their phytochemicals. Uh, one of the best books you can get to understand this and, uh, is, is called Bringing Nature Home by Dr. Douglas Tallamy. That's the uh, book on the left. Uh, he says that a plant that is not being eat, eaten by something is not doing its job. And that's very true. And you will, by reading that, you'll understand how important it is for, uh, uh, to preserve and, and encourage insects. And the way you do that is by planting native trees and shrubs. For instance, oak trees. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of different species of moths and butterflies that, that use oak trees as their host plant. And uh, the birds know this, and so when they're migrating in April, they'll head to the oak trees because that's, they know that's where the insects will be. And when we're out bird watching, like at St. George Island or somewhere else, that's where we go because we know that's where the birds are. Uh, when you buy plants, uh, and we do have a native nursery in, in town, or in, in, uh, in the area. It's called Sand Hills Native Nursery, and they will be able to uh, sell you uh, the native stuff. Uh, please avoid the stuff that you buy in uh, the big stores like Home Depot, Walmart. Uh, a, lot of a lot of times they're not native, and they may be actually uh, harmful to the plants. Uh, the ones uh, harmful to the birds, but avoid pest-free plants. Those are ones that have been treated with these uh, in, uh, harmful poisons called uh, neonicotinoids. It's a derivative of, of uh, nicotine. It's a poison. It's a systemic poison that gets into the uh, whole, whole uh, plant, and when the uh, insect eats it, it dies. Well, you don't want that if you're trying to attract birds or insects. Remember, 95% of insects are not, not harmful. And insects are the real bird food. Now, you can feed birds seeds and th uh, fruits, but they have to have insects to be able to lay eggs and reproduce. So there's no other alternative. Uh, also, earthworms and things like that. And obviously, if you're a hawk, you're eating you know, animals and not insects too much. So uh, protein that, that uh, comes ma mainly in the form of insects. Okay, and uh, the other book I started me out on this questioning what I was doing with my yard is Requiem for a Lawnmower. So this lady decided she was tired of mowing her yard and, and uh, fertilizing it, and she decided to do away with it. And this book just tells how she did that. Okay, uh, if you're going to attract birds, you don't need cats. Uh, cats naturally kill birds. That's what what they do. Um, they not just millions, but actually billions of birds every year are killed by uh, feral cats and outdoor pet cats. They're not cats are not native to the United States, and bells don't work. Uh, they still will hunt down and kill a a bird. Please keep them indoors. They'll be happier and uh, live longer. So what can you do? Well, uh, you can join Audubon, come with us on some of our field trips, listen to some of our programs. Sweet Bay Chapter uh, will uh, guide you in if you want to establish a native uh, landscape yard. And we do have brochures up here, so please come check them out. And then the Bay County Conservancy. Uh, that you know is focused on land preservation. That's uh, we all work hand in hand, and a lot of us are in the same organizations. So, uh, any questions? Well, Tom, the year of our broadcast was native plant seeds. If I get some dangerous. 
uh, this time of the year. Hang on just a second, Dale. Did you want to give him the... Well, they're doing this to, for rec recording purposes. I'm wondering what time of the year to broadcast native plant seeds. Um, I'm wondering if, there's, if it's too early this time of the year. Do we need to wait for frost or broadcast them? You, seeds? No wind to... Are you talking about wildflower seeds? Wildflower seeds, yeah. Yes, right now. Right now. The winter time, yeah. Uh, best to do it right before a rain. So they get good and set in, you know, and they don't blow away, and the birds don't eat them. So uh, I, I put mine out, I think, last week or week before. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes? Um, I'm still a book person, and I'm still a book person, and um, I can tell you that um, Bay County Public Library is a gold mine of books about all of this stuff. I highly recommend that you take advantage of your tax dollars by going to the public. Exactly, library. yeah, I agree. Uh, th that's really a great source of information. There's, they have lots and lots of bird books, uh, as well as uh, books on native plants. So. And the internet is incredible. You know, I mean, if you see a bird or whatever, you can find it online. Have as much luck doing that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I like my books too, but. I have a question about the, um, the way that our freshwater systems spill into some of our saltwater systems here locally, uh, outfalls from beach lakes and maybe some of the creeks that run into the bays. Um, what kind of birds do you see around those areas that maybe mitigate that fresh and salt water at the same time? Hmm, uh, I'm not quite sure of the, the question. Uh, you talking about some of the I guess birds the that just share, uh, share both uh, salt and freshwater habitat. Oh, well, uh, lots of species of birds, like the rails, the clapper rails, they, can, they thrive in a kind of a brackish uh, environment, but they can also, uh, they like uh, salt water. Um, you'll see them in fresh and saltwater marshes, so they're very adaptable. Rails, blackbirds, uh, some of the uh, sh smaller shorebirds. Um, I see what else. Maybe coot or a moorhen, maybe? Yeah, uh, well, the moorhens are more of a freshwater species, but the, the rails is the main thing that comes to mind, like clapper rails, Virginia rails, and soras. Thank you. Okay. Yes. We have a firecracker plant. That's the best that I know it's called. It's a beautiful red blooming plant, and it, it attracts all kinds of birds. It, it's not native, but I do have one too, uh, it's, uh, and it does, uh, it does attract uh, hummingbirds and, and butterflies. So it's a very nice plant. It can get pretty big, and it will, uh, it will try to take over, so if you do plant it, maybe put it in a pot so it doesn't spread so much. What is the plant name again? A firecracker plant. A firecracker. It makes little tiny red flowers, but it's not native, so it's not the host plant for anything. Fire spike is another non-native, but it's also but it's good for uh, hummingbirds and uh, butterflies. It does die back in the uh, winter, but it'll, it'll come back. So it's okay to use. It's not invasive. Yes, ma'am. Does anyone else sub sub <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> subscribe to uh, Birds and Blooms? I just got my current one, and I saw something I've never seen before, a yellow cardinal, and supposedly it's in Alabama. Somebody found it in Alabama. And it was actually at, at uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville, like in March and April of this year, or one like it. So I was there that week, but didn't know it was there. So <laughs> I was very upset when I got home and saw everybody posting it. And I'm like, oh, I was right there. So. The, the write-up said 
that, that the yellow male cardinal shacked up with um, a female <laughs> cardinal and that they have raised one baby. Huh. It's in interesting. I, uh, what can I say? <laughs> um, if I may, I would like to ask a question. Okay. I oftentimes see people hanging their hummingbird feeders low. What do we say about that? Is that the is that the preference of the bird? Is that a good practice, or is I've, that just something people I've, are doing? I've never seen anybody do that. Usually, it's yeah. like eye level, so okay. you can get it, you know. But you, you don't want it too low because you know cats might come and get the sure. bird. And okay. uh, I wondered why I was seeing that. So for no good reason, then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it's right at seven o'clock, so I think we did good. Thank you so much for sharing um, your beautiful photos. I am amazed at the detail, and those are just wonderful. Thank you so much, Donna, and thank you for sharing, um, you know, how to attract birds, uh, best practices uh, for our lawns and things like that, so that we can host uh, all of these beautiful birds. Creating those layers, I think, is the key. Um, any for sure? Any anyone else have any other questions? Want to make sure that you get those in. Yeah, yeah. How many bird feeders? How many bird feeders does Donna have? Uh, <laughs> I have. I haven't been filling them all up. I um, I have a platform feeder that certain birds like and the squirrels love. Uh, that my husband made for me, so it's just about a 12 by 12. I have one that I fill up about every three days that the other little birds like, and. Then I've got a couple of small containers to put the mealworms in. And then sometimes I just put a seed on my concrete. Uh, I've been working from home since the hurricane in my dining room. And I have this big window and that's uh, what I look at is, is that uh, all my feeders. So I know what's coming pretty much all day long. And uh, so even if, uh, I hate to say I've never had a problem with what's with birds. Uh, no, starlings. starlings. Uh, I have year. till this year, and they <laughs> showed up, and I don't like them, and I don't know how to get rid of them, and they're bullies, uh, except for the woodpecker. <laughs> woodpecker stands up for himself. Um, so I, I don't have a lot. I used to, some of, some of the photos, like with the Eurasian collar doves, that used to be my backyard, so I had them out there, but now that I'm working in the dining room, they're all in the front. Uh, but just make sure you've got stuff around that they can land on and feel kind of safe. Um, and in the mornings when I go to put the, the feed out, you know, that, I mean, that, uh, Yellow belly or the uh, woodpecker is there almost instantly. You know, he knows I'm coming out there to put food out. And uh, so between him and the mockingbird and then the bluebirds show up probably within just a few minutes. I'd like to add something. The bluebirds are usually one of the first things we'll out in the morning. And 11 of those species of birds that she showed have nested in our yard. And there's another 12 species of orchard orioles that has nested in our yard also. It wasn't in the program. Pretty good success in our yeah, all it takes is some knowledge, some effort. Right? Yeah, and like care. I said, I'm not a, I have no biology degree, you know, uh, I do have help from him, that's my husband, uh, so uh, between him and my daughter who now teaches biology, but, uh, you know, this kind of started made me because I like cameras and then it just kept developing and unfortunately you know you start shooting birds and you got to have longer lenses and you know then I have to keep working to afford my camera habit so uh. yeah. these are very he heavy lenses hers is about not quite that long <laughs> typically I I've got one lens I do 
I thought I had to have it, but I, I have to know where I'm going because it weighs 13 pounds. I don't use that one very often. Most of the, yeah. Uh, Nikon has come out with a 500 PF, and I love it. Uh, it's light, and uh, you know, um, I, I, I don't have to use a tripod, so. And one other thing, in, in, in the spring, we may be offering uh, or education encore, uh, and we, Audubon Society does a uh, does a, a, a series of several uh, programs on birds. So be sure you check that out. It's education encore right here at, at the college, and we'll be doing. Uh, I, I teach one on how to identify birds by sound, and then there's other people that teach, you know, other things about birding, how to yes. become a birder. Oh, thank that you. Thank thing. you for sharing that. So yes, here at the college we have um, continuing education courses. I think they, it was kind of formerly known as the Encore series, and they're typically on Fridays. Not a whole day kind of thing, but it's, it's a, they offer a variety of different sessions throughout the day, very, very reasonably priced. Laura Herder, Laura Herder is the lady you would want to talk to if you want to sign up for those courses. I'm so glad to hear that you'll be offering some in the spring. And can you remind us again when you guys are going to be going out to Conservation Park? It's not this weekend, but it's the next weekend at 7.30. If you know where the conservation, the Panama City Beach Conservation Park is, we'll be there at 7.30. And, uh, and when we were there just about three weeks ago, we have a uh, vermilion flycatcher. Uh, they're not, they're bright red. And uh, <laughs> if you get a chance, because they don't normally come this far east. Uh, more, I guess, Texas and that area. So for one to be hanging out here, and, and I think we've spotted him last year and the year before, or there used to be one that went to St. Mark's, and he was there forever, and the last couple years he hasn't been showing up. So I'm not sure if this guy is, if he's decided not to go as far as St. Mark's or not, and we're getting him, so. So maybe, so next week on, you said the Saturday at 7.30 a.m.? Did you say the Saturday? Mm -hmm. The 19th then? The 19th of November, 7.30 a.m., Conservation Park, about a mile past Highway 79. Yeah, and probably meeting at the Visitor Center. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. A beautiful place to have a field trip. Thank you. That's right, it's the <laughs> facilities, that's right. Well, well, again, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation, wonderful information. Yes. So thank you, Ron. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to let you know that this is the last citizen science of this year, uh, but we do have three scheduled for the spring on February the 21st. February the 21st, we have the Tupelo Beekeepers Association. Ray Brodery, I hope I said that correctly, will be joining us. So uh, Tupelo Beekeepers. And then March the 31st, did I write that right? Maybe, the, excuse me, March the 21st, March the 21st, PCB Turtle Watch, Kennard Watson will be with us. And then April the 11th, St. Andrew and St. Joseph Bay Estuary Program, Dr. Jessica Graham will be with us. And don't worry, we'll make sure to get that information out to you. Thanks so much for coming out tonight.